Shut up and sit down. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Fight for Liberty show. Today, we are joined by a very good friend of mine, Mr. Robert White, who is uh, one of just the the inspirations in my life of kind of philosophical thought and one of the thinkers that, that I go to. So I want you guys to hear from him as well. So, Mr. White, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. I was very excited uh, to get uh, asked to be on this. Well, we are glad to have you. Um, so I definitely wanted to uh, start out by just kind of getting a, a rough idea of where where you do stand uh, philosophically. Um, so I thought it would be it would be easier to to lay this out in in a, a more intricate question. So I'm curious, what are like three of the biggest eureka moments that helped shape what you believe right now? Okay. Yeah. So first of all. Yeah, the term obviously philosophy is so broad. You could break it down a little bit, um, and you could you could break that down into two big things for myself. Uh, and and I'm going to come back to your question. But um, mm -hmm. first, I'm a Christian, and a lot of what I do online and with my own podcast uh, and website is um, I, actually I don't. I'm not like a Christian apologist that much where I'm like out there trying to like Christianity is true. And this is all the reasons why it is. I have some of that stuff, uh, mm -hmm. hopefully in a, a more substantial <laughs> way than I just implied. I'm really <laughs> shooting myself in the foot three minutes into this. And, um, but, but no, the, the broader thing, and actually what I probably care about more um, philosophically is just having to do with uh, truth. Um, and so epistemology, which is like how we know things mm. is a big focus of mine. Uh, but I can't like in my own uh, worldview, like Christianity is such a big part of that. But just to to answer your question, um, yeah, there's a few different moments, I would say. Uh, some are more gradual than others. So you couldn't totally say is Eureka, but more um, a shift. Um, mm -hmm. So one of the most foundational things was simply coming to realize how foundational to everything, even things you wouldn't expect, is tr truth. And just a focusing on truth at all costs, basically. And ironically, I think one of the things that made me feel that way was not the things you would expect, which is like uh, external objective facts, but really things having to do with like relationships and self-reflection um, because I think as you, you grow up, you, you realize you come to this point where you realize everyone has these like blind spots about themselves or, or relationships and stuff. And that it is incredibly hard to get around that and mm -hmm. to accept those things. And uh, maybe I was just naively, uh, you know, uh, pushing forward, but I was like, I want to, push past that if possible. Like I want to realize those things. And when it came, so I grew up a Christian, I want to realize my faith is wrong. If it is, mm -hmm. um, I want to, you know, get on with my life as a happy atheist or whatever, if that, if that's the truth. Um, so I just, yeah, I just realized truth is, is everything in a sense that everything we love about life, um, or I should say so many things we love about life, first have that basis in truth. Uh, I mean, and I'm really thinking human relationships that, uh, I mean, once you s truth starts to slip, uh, everything goes out the window. So that was a big shift, oh, right. just realizing truth. I just had to just double, triple, quadruple down on truth uh, everywhere I could. So that, that was a big shift. Um, and then two other shifts, I would say one was the initial cracks in my Christian belief. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And um, most people would say the the beliefs I had growing up were um, some of them were fundamentalist, just as far as like a kind of a young earth creationism, uh, <laughs> kind of a, a wooden simplistic way of looking at the Bible, um, those sort of things. So a second shift was coming to terms with those cracks and then realizing those cracks meant serious fault lines in some cases. Um, and then and dealing with that, that was a very big shift. Mm-hmm. And then my third one, and this was more of a true Eureka moment. And I think you'll find this interesting, uh, David. Um, I actually, on my own podcast, I described this in an episode called From Engineer to Intuition, From Engineer to Intuitionist. And mm-hmm. so I, I am a uh, software engineer. I've always been very analytical um, and philosophical. And so as soon as I learned more uh, critical thinking and engineering and stuff, of any sort um for someone like me it's super exciting because it's like oh okay there's these systems out there to mm-hmm. solve these hard problems including truth okay so it's like oh okay we just got to learn these systems and then apply the right system and then you get the perfect output basically right and um and that is better i would say than just like a naive epistemology where you just sort of uh you know, you, you're just like blowing in the wind with how you see the world. Mm -hmm. The problem is I think many, many people get stuck at that level where you're all about these systems of truth. And it was a big moment for me. I don't know exactly what caused it. I can cite, uh, one book in particular that, uh, helped me see this. And it's, uh, one of my favorite books ever, one of the most, um, obtuse books ever as well called, Mm -hmm. Girdle Escher Bach by Douglas Hofstadter. Uh, hmm. It's actually, uh, it won the Pulitzer Prize for nonfiction in the like 70s. It's pretty old. Uh, it is a classic in the field of, uh, or at least people with, who have interest in AI, anything related to that, because it's about consciousness. And um, in one of the, it has all these vignettes in it that are fascinating um, as uh, introing each chapter. And in one of the vignettes, the thing he illustrates is that the fundamental rules of logic, the most sure sounding things we have, um, the most sure things we have as far as when it comes to truth, that the fundamental rules of logic are actually intuitively grasped, that you bottom out, that you once you get to those fundamental axioms of logic, mm-hmm. you can't convince anyone of them. They either see it or they don't. And it's so baked into our brains uh, kind of like object permanence that you can't you can't get outside that kind of but the thing is you can't actually argue it either because mm-hmm. it's, it's the axiom it's the bottom and so that was a revolution to realize that actually at bottom it's this intuitive grasp of something is actually the most fundamental thing and so every system of logic um or uh, I I give the example of like um, a pro con list, a pro con list to make a decision sounds very solid and concrete. It sounds so much more logical than simply uh, making the decision without, you know, uh, systematizing it at all. But when you make a pro con list, there's actually all these in judgment calls, intuitive judgment calls going into the pro con list of, of, um, you know, how much you weight each item, uh, which uh, obviously what items you put in there. And then then you do, then you have to, yeah, you have to do some calculation based on it. And that's going to be judgment calls. So basically we can't escape our own intuition. We just need to use it the best way possible. And so really we don't overthrow intuition with logic. We throw overthrow intuition with better intuition, with more clear intuition. And so like a really good math math proof um, each step is as intuitively obvious as possible. And um, you want the proof that is the most intuitively obvious and broken down the, to the most clear steps. And so that that was a shift of like, all of a sudden I had been thinking, find the system and like, that will s- save me, you know? <laughs> and then it, it was like, wait, it's, it's more complicated than that. Mm-hmm. And there is uh, these intuitive judgment calls and since we can't get rid of them, we should learn about them and use them the wisest way possible. So that, that actually was a pretty big Eureka moment for me. That's, that's a really interesting uh, take on it that, yeah, I don't, I don't know if I've ever 
I've ever really thought about it like that. Uh, Did I it like just blow that. your mind? <laughs> a little bit, yeah. Uh, dude, that is honestly my favorite part about doing these. Uh, this show is just getting to get my mind blown by like people that are so much smarter than me in the areas that I just I can't. I think it's imp it's impossible to be like quote unquote the perfect person. You know how you were talking about like if you, if I can just figure out all of the the things, right? We can't figure out all of the things unless we try to talk to and understand all of the people. And right, that's right. kind of been my push. Uh, like, especially in 2020, I was out campaigning and doing a lot and meeting a lot of people and trying to just get a grasp of, of what America actually thinks instead of what my echo chamber thinks. And it's a huge step in, in the right direction. And I, it, I think to to your later point of intuition it has fundamentally changed how i make decisions uh, and judgment calls uh and you know the last week and a half has been a really good example of that because you know everybody was really really quick to have an opinion about what happened at the capitol yeah. and the whole time i was just like do we even know what happened yet like why don't we just yeah. kind of hold off and like make sure that we know all of the facts before we have an opinion on it. And that's still my stance because we still really don't know what happened. So until right. then, you know, impeaching people and banning people and anything is futile if we don't even know that they did anything. Prove that, you know, and then let's talk, you know, innocent until proven guilty. That's that's the whole thing. Um, and it's it's definitely a different stance than I would have taken a year ago, for sure. Yeah, that's that's interesting because that brings up a lot of naughty epistemological issues as well. Uh, and I would probably so so one thing that's interesting about this discussion, I, I'm going to pause to to say is I actually don't dabble in politics too very much. Right. Um, I tend I like the foundation underneath it, which is philosophy, and once you cash that out into actual policy, things get infinitely more complicated and there's all these repercussions you don't even know about. Um, and so um, it can be tempting to be kind of a coward and not, you know, try it all. And so I am trying, but it is very difficult for me because mm -hmm. um, it, things get so complicated. And I think 95% of people out there are probably, 70% more confident in their view than they probably should be uh, politically. Yep. Um, so, so I actually lean towards what you just described. However, um, like I probably would differ with you. Like, I mean, based on the knowledge I have, like I'm, I think I'm for impeachment. Um, I think we can make general judgment calls of uh, roughly what happened, you know, there's sure there's going to be a lot more that comes out and um, not to throw too much philosophy and epistemology at it. But like um, one of the ways I frame this is thinking in terms of uh, like heuristics. And um, and one thing we often decide is when do you when is it proper to appeal to authority uh, for for knowledge? Uh, because we're we're all doing that to a degree all the time, you know, with newspapers and uh, media and even textbooks. You know, I mean, that's an authority. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, the way I would look at it is, I feel like I have a strong enough heuristic that certain things happened last Tuesday. That yeah, I could be wrong, and we, we always could be wrong about everything including the moon landing or whatever but <laughs> but you also have to you also you don't want to be inert where you mm -hmm. because then you just never do anything and people die you know right. and so you have to do um and i would draw the line probably more modestly um than a lot of people um as far as like I, i'm a little bit more careful probably to step out maybe to a fault even um, and it sounds like you're drawing it even more carefully, at least with like the event last Tuesday. Mm -hmm. Uh, but what, what I really will agree with you on David is that it's always a healthy exercise, mental exercise to reset like that. Like, even if you're someone who's pro impeachment, 
uh, or anti-impeachment to to reset, jumble everything up again, and, and you're testing it. You're you're doing mm -hmm. a uh, thought experiment, literally, and to see if it changes um, how you you think. And you can ask questions of like, if you know, if uh, it really was Antifa people all dressed up as Trump supporters as one mm -hmm. very popular conspiracy theory. Um, uh, for me, depressingly popular conspiracy theory. If if it really were that, then how would you explain this other data? Or what would you expect here? There's some simple tests you can do that mm -hmm. um, one of my favorite things is, um, have you heard the term abductive reasoning before? Yeah. So the people say, um, I think they generally say that like Sherlock Holmes would do that, but it, it's a complicated, it's a more complicated term than it needs to be. All it really means is uh, inference to the best explanation. And what you're doing is given the data, which explanation fits best and what can you rule out? And um, so for some of these political events, you can, um, I think you can make a healthy probabilistic judgment relatively quickly and then you can allow that to be changed based on someone smart coming to you and being like look this is not getting out there enough but here's this uh here's this data or whatever right um so like here's an example one of the main reasons i don't believe almost any conspiracy theory is because of this uh abductive reasoning this heuristic of how would this thing be true and they're not being more people whistleblowing. Like, why is there only this one or two people or something? Um, mm -hmm. Are you a conspiracy theorist, David? Do you believe so? I, I, there are definitely plenty that I would, people would consider conspiracy theories that I do believe. I, moon landing, I think, is, is a step further than I would go. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I'm definitely somebody that believes that, um, you know, the, the Twin Towers didn't fall just because planes hit them. Okay. Um, I definitely, and I, I think uh, to your point, there is insurmountable uh, evidence and like a clear logical basis of why that would be yeah. lied about and why people wouldn't be whistleblowing about that. And, you know, there's plenty of people in jail for whistleblowing about other things to do with the war in the Middle East. So to, I think it's when you see the, people crack down on whistleblowing in a specific area, it kind of makes the rest of what they say in that area a little bit sketchier to me, uh, which is why, especially with um, the uh, the events of last Wednesday, I was very hesitant to just accept the mainstream media narrative because the first thing that we're told is usually bullshit. Usually like, by the second or third story that the media has gotten to, that's a little bit closer to accurate. But the first thing that they say, I feel like is, is you just, I never want to just accept it at face value. Cause you know, now a very common theory uh, that they're finding a lot of proof to uh, about last Wednesday is that it might have been a few Republican members of Congress that planned the whole thing and trump had zero clue about it and yeah. like that might be true you know for all you know people were just counting on trump to say those couple of dog whistles that he will always say to rile people up just that little bit but you know trump was very explicit about saying you know we need to respect the police we're there to support congress you know he was very very anti-violence in his speech uh, but he was just enough pro takeover or pro revolution to to push people in the right direction if they were already pushed in that direction. So I think I don't know. Like I said, we still don't fully know what happened. I, as far as impeachment goes, I'm more anti impeachment because the dude's got five days left in office, and we have more important things for Congress to be working on right now. Uh, if if what they're saying is true, act, like imp I would be anti-impeachment if he had longer in office, but I think at this point mm -hmm. it's kind of silly to try to kick him out. The most they'll be able to do it by is like Monday. So you're going to yeah. get him out like what, two, three days early? Big deal. But 
I, to me, the bigger idea is a, a rebuke and of of an action um to kind of set precedent and also mm -hmm. to bar him from from office those are the the bigger things for me i mean yeah it, it obviously it's gonna it's probably literally gonna do nothing nothing to get him out earlier because it doesn't sound like they'll even start the proceedings till uh biden is inaugurated anyway and i i, right. I just realized i said uh last tuesday i keep on i think i keep on thinking it's last tuesday it was uh uh wednesday um wednesday. i remember it was one six but yeah uh, I got Tuesday in my brain, maybe because nine 11 happened on a Tuesday. And so Tuesday <laughs> is like the, the big thing in my brain. Um, but, uh, would you agree that like, and, and this is the thing, and this is something I value a lot is I, as soon as you say you think there's something to like the nine 11 type stuff, it's, I want to be like, tell me more. I'm not going to close a door. You know, mm -hmm. uh, I, I mean, if I had to put betting money on it, I still, you know, wouldn't bet that there was a conspiracy or whatever, but like, I'm fully, let, let's hear it. You know, mm -hmm. uh, would you agree that our sort of default should perhaps be the sensible, more, you know, quote unquote, sensible mundane narrative. And if something pushes us outside of that, that's fine. But perhaps the default should still be the more commonly accepted view, perhaps? Um, I think that, hmm, that's an int uh, uh, it's a good question. I, I think that we, we can't default to um, accepting a mainstream narrative. I think that's kind of dangerous because that lends you to, um, you know, just kind of, I, I really, really, really hate when people bring this kind of stuff up. But, you know, that's that's how you get, you know, a, a Nazi-controlled country where people are just kind of like, okay, yeah, this, uh, sure, 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 that works. You know, if, um, or like, uh, I don't know, have you read uh, 1984 by yes. Orwell? Okay, you know, you get, you get a, a society like that if that kind of thinking continues for too many generations and right. there is it there you need contrarianism a little bit i think that's sure. yeah that's one of the the reasons i exist in the world <laughs> you know you need you need assholes like me that go okay but but that's the name of this podcast really, right? assholes <laughs> like me right <laughs> it should be damn uh <laughs> then the next one i do will be then you need to introduce people. Be like, all right, today we have asshole Robert White to join me. You know, the whole bit. You know, that would be great. Uh, but yeah, I definitely think uh, you know, and and really to your your very original point, uh, we need to keep up this fight for truth. Yes, uh, and make sure that just because a lie is a well uh, well told and very uh accepted lie doesn't mean it's it's true you right. know um christmas isn't about santa you know <laughs> no matter honestly christmas isn't even really about jesus you know december 25th you know we can yeah. you know there just because society says this is a thing you know i think it's important to make sure that we still have at least a little little piece of contrarian in us to uh keep us from basically getting brainwashed uh i totally agree with that absolutely yeah um but i definitely uh i think that there is also a especially within the libertarian community there's a, a propensity to try to go to the extreme in cases like this you know especially if you're talking about conspiracy theories it's like anything that questions the government narrative Right. is more likely to be true because the government is always wrong and always evil. Exactly. Uh, and, you know, there's definitely a train of thought there that I would consider equally dangerous because uh, it's it's basically the opposite, but still the same thing. It's still just always assuming mm -hmm. one thing. You're kind of still a slave to something, you know, right. like in your epistemology. Mm hmm. Yeah, and I think that's that's just something that I've seen way too much, especially in the libertarian community of of where, you know, any form of dogmatic belief in something is is a problem. You know, if you're if you're not willing to 
to look at things objectively. If you think government always bad or government always good or Democrat always bad or uh, Republican always good or, you know, Christian always good. You know, uh, right, that's, right, yeah, that, you know I, I don't know how many people I know very, very personally that voted for Donald Trump because he was a pro-life Christian. Yep. Yep, exactly. You know, that, and, that's a problem. <laughs> and just to, yeah, kind of reword, I think the way I would approach conspiracy theories is that um, part of my core epistemology is that I want to ground myself on the most sure things and then only tiptoe out to the less sure things. I want to fully explore those less sure things. Like if someone brings it to my attention and it's worth it, let's do it. Let's go that route, you know, um, you know, convince me. Uh, but I want to try to, to, to ground and to base my life and uh, everything else on, on the most sure stuff and then tiptoe out. Um, and here's, okay. I'm going to be curious to hear your, your thought on this. It has to do with climate change. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm getting this from um, a book that uh, was uh, just as revolutionary in my thinking as like, you know, a uh, girl Escher Bach and it's called the black Swan by Nassim Taleb. Mm -hmm. Have you heard of uh, Nassim Taleb or the black Swan? David? I have, I've heard of it. I have not read. I love it. I highly recommend it. And the cool thing is even though it's like, uh, somewhat dense 360 pages or something like that. You can really get the gist 50 or hundred pages in as well, but this is something he brings up and I love it really illustrates what uh, I would call black swan thinking. And he is, he thinks human caused, or, or this is how he would say it. He doesn't think we should be putting um, greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. He doesn't think, we should not because he is thoroughly convinced that humans are causing it. Um, but instead he retreats to more sure knowledge. And that sure knowledge is the fact that weather is extremely complex. We still don't have a full understanding of how we affect the environment and all the repercussions that uh, putting a certain gas out into the atmosphere. And so that is our most sure foundation is that this thing it's really a humble epistemology it's looking out and saying this is a very complex thing we still don't know that much about um there's variables we still don't understand and so we should not be messing with it unless we're really sure we know what, what we're doing and i like that because it completely avoids debating research papers by scientists about mm -hmm. the uh co2 you know correlation and stuff like that and in general like i once again this is not something i've dug deep in but in general i believe the you know consensus of science vast consensus of scientists or whatever that uh uh well yeah i don't even know the numbers obviously there's a vast consensus that it's it's warming and i think there's a pretty strong consensus that it's human um human cause but even if that weren't the case i don't think we should mess be messing with it without being fully sure of the repercussions so i like that because it, it illustrates how you can kind of remove the danger uh, of error uh, because you're retreating into the, the more sure stuff mm -hmm. and you can't always do it that neat and tidy, you know, and we have to make decisions based on stuff that we're not sure about. I'm, I don't want to oversimplify, you know, all these things. Um, and I always want to be stretched out there, like stretch me out there. But in the end, I'm going to try to, to stay as solid on the most solid things. And once again, when it comes to conspiracy theories, if you get too loose, then not only are the libertarians believing the conspiracy theories that, you know, question governments or whatever, but then uh, the hardline liberals are believing their conspiracy theories and the hardline uh, conservatives are believing theirs. And they're all different conspiracy theories that conflict and uh, cause you to see the other side in a dangerous way or whatever. So yeah. uh, that that's how I see that sort of topic. I like that. I definitely, I like the kind of unifying approach of you know we don't we don't understand so let's not fuck it up rather than uh i know more than you so you have to listen to me because because exactly. yeah. i'm science uh right. you know i think we had i had a, a kind of similar stance when it came to covid uh you know it 
do the masks work? We don't know, but we don't know that they don't work. So wear one. <laughs> like exactly. No, that's a very, like, very good example. Yeah. You know, or, it's not about like don't show me some scientific thing that they don't work because I can show you some scientific thing that they do work. Why don't we just right. try our best to make sure that we are not killing each other and you know let's also listen to the things that say maybe masks make it worse for the people that are wearing them so don't wear them unless you have to wear it like wearing one alone in your car is moronic like mm -hmm. let's listen to both sides science and make a, an educated kind of decision instead of being again dogmatic right yeah no that's a good example i do the safer thing regardless kind of mm -hmm. yeah and i think there there's definitely there's definitely a danger to that line of thinking but it's there's an easy line to draw i think of cuz you you can't take it too far and say uh you know don't do anything cuz things might be dangerous you know i think you know we could see kind of an evolution of parenting over the last like two generations where now kids are significantly just softer individuals because they weren't allowed to get hurt as a kid the way that we were or our parents were uh, you know you want to stick a fork in the socket it's going to hurt but like <laughs> go for it like um, yes. you know it teaches you lessons like that and so but i think it's pretty easy to to go with the safer, more logical route without taking that too far and becoming some like sheltered, agoraphobic kind of person. And, and we're really ultimately talking about two different things there, though, because like one has to do with knowledge about what is dangerous and one has to do with what you do now that you know what is dangerous. So um, like the mask thing, it's a debate over is it dangerous or not to to not wear a mask mm -hmm. and um, we're saying it's better to, as far as what you believe, to act as if it is dangerous because that's the, the safer epistemology. Now you get to decide what to do with that. So like a government, for instance, um, or a body of people could decide that um, we're going to take the safer epistemology that masks do help since it's, you know, it's an easy, relatively easy thing to do or whatever. But we're going to decide for young people to not wear a mask and do herd human uh, immunity or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm just saying the action can be separate from the, the knowledge mm -hmm. that um, we should take the safer, more sure knowledge, but we can act differently. Like, or the climate change, you could decide that it's, uh, I don't think anyone should do this, but decide that it's actually worth it to just, you know burn up all that oil and even though you're you're taking the epistemology that this is a dangerous thing that's mm -hmm. very different than someone who says let's burn all the fossil fuels uh because it's probably not dangerous anyway you know th those are right. very different things so so yeah, yeah i agree with you about like healthy risk taking you know you can mm -hmm. do you get to decide how much risk taking you want to do after you've you've evaluated the situation right i think i think that's definitely a healthy way way to look at it and you know yeah I've, I've actually i've heard that argument uh when it comes to climate change i've heard a very like logical drawn out argument of we need to continue to use dirty energy to develop methods of better clean energy that we will be able to use when we get closer to running out now is not the time to stop give us another five to ten years it's not quite that dangerous, but we need to continue to go full steam to find these solutions. No pun intended, full steam. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. So, you know, if, and that line of thinking is significantly more understandable than like what you said, ah, it's probably not dangerous anyway. Cause right. like we can see it's dangerous or even, even if you don't think it's dangerous, it's gonna run out. Like you can't deny that part. Like right. we are burning coal significantly faster than the earth can create it. We will run out. And if your entire life and business and technology and everything is built around something that's finite, you're going to crash eventually. You're going to get fucked. So don't do that thing. I don't, I don't understand the people that are still so sunk into uh, fossil fuels uh, financially. Yeah. Like, uh, even the the freaking Koch brothers are getting out of fossil fuels. The um, 
and I'm gonna space on the the other name, the not the Carnegies, the other family that had all the the, the Rockefellers. Oh, okay. Um, the the Rockefellers own more c clean energy than they do fossil fuels now. Oh wow, I didn't know that. Yeah, so like it's it's just a smarter business move. Even if all you care about right. is money, renewable energy is the way to go at this point. Tesla's the opinion. most valuable car company in the oh, world, yeah. or whatever you know. Yeah, I mean, these people... actually I just saw an article. You're you're making the very point I I saw in um, the Economist, I believe, that all of a sudden clean energy actually might be the the better business now, which mm -hmm. is great, awesome, you know. Yeah, they had to they had to break a line of profitability within clean energy, uh, which they did about like two or three years ago, realistically, where uh, you know the average consumer can afford uh, to replace the majority of their energy consumption with clean energy right now. You know, mm -hmm. my parents' house has solar panels on it. Uh, you know, we, oh, cool. uh, you know, you, even in New York City, there's companies uh, that you can get all of your, your energy from renewable energy and it's like two bucks a month more. You know, there's, there's just, there's so much more uh, availability in the market right. uh, for clean energy that it is now finally about the same cost. Right. Uh, and these things are, for the most part, significantly uh, better once they're built. Like a solar farm or, or a, a, a wind turbine is actually going to last you longer, require less maintenance, and be cheaper to produce more energy. Wow than like uh an oil rig so wow. well not by itself because it doesn't produce as much energy but mm -hmm. still relatively you know in cost it's it's gonna end up being cheaper to produce the same amount of energy with wind turbines so yeah it's it's now finally like i said for the last like maybe two years been good business to be into clean energy and we've seen a shift we've seen tesla skyrocket with some of the other things that they're doing to make uh, once again clean energy unintended better. puns well okay sorry i was thinking uh spacex with uh, skyrocket elon, skyrocket. <laughs> <laughs> elon definitely has skyrocketed uh, the past years yeah so has his That's your, your secret talent david is to <laughs> all these unintended puns i'm loving it apparently normally they're intended but <laughs> this, this time it's just been i've been killing it with the unintended <laughs> Uh, um, but yeah, I think definitely seen a culture shift uh, of people who are less gung ho about the world and 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 climate change and other things like that shifting to clean and, and renewable energy also. Uh, yeah, and and it's because of these other forms of reasoning. You know, you can't just shout at people. I know science. You're killing my kids. Mm -hmm. because it's not gonna it's not gonna change hearts and minds you know eventually you're gonna have to make right. it hurt their wallet to be a bad human right yeah yeah and part of it is kind of like what you just implied to is like the the tone of voice and stuff too you know and it's like once again maybe i can be almost too soft to reaching across the aisle sort of thing but everyone would agree that that is more likely to to actually have a fruitful conversation. Um, mm -hmm. So I don't know where the line is, where you start yelling at people, but I just know people default to that too much now. And and then people just shut down conversation. And now you've lost your ability to, to influence that party. For sure. Um, so one thing I did want to uh, get your opinion on, because you know you already mentioned that you, you don't partake too heavily in politics, um, but you do partake heavily in, in philosophy and religion. And uh, one of the things that I've been kind of pondering over a lot lately is to what degree uh, I allow my religious beliefs to influence my political beliefs. Oh, uh, wow, and, yeah. and I'm curious uh, kind of where you draw that line, where you, uh, cause you know, for me as a libertarian, it's, it's a lot easier with that kind of dogma. I know we've talked about why that, those reasonings are bad, but it's easy for me to say, you know, none of my beliefs should really affect my political beliefs because all of my political beliefs are you do you and I'll do me. Mm -hmm. uh, right. Yeah. So I'm curious for someone who does kind of value the existence of government a little bit more than I do. 
uh, mm -hmm. where where you kind of draw that line for yourself? Um, yeah, that is a really good question that I I probably will never have fully solved. Um, <laughs> I get but, that. Yeah. Uh, but first thing is funny. I think um, I definitely used to say I I was either libertarian or leaned more that way. Um, I don't. Yeah. I mean, once again, about dabbling in politics, like I, I struggle with that. I probably am more just closer to liberalism now, maybe. Mm -hmm. But certain things, I I'm definitely on the conservative side. Maybe I'm a moderate. Um, I don't know. I I can be convinced of different things in different conversations, um, <laughs> for, for better or worse. Uh, I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to make that a brag, you know? Um, so <laughs> yeah, it, it is tough, but I, I guess the reason why I brought that up is I sympathize with a lot of libertarian ideas. Um, yeah, I mean, actually I, yeah, I would say in a sense, my default is actually libertarianism. I kind of agree with the idea that, Every time you add government to a situation, you add significant risk, rot, um, complexity mm -hmm. that over time rots, you know, it causes all these issues. Um, and so, but I think I might just be someone who, who acknowledges that, but thinks that um, there are times when you actually do want significant government. Uh, and in fact, before I answer your your original question, um, I here's another eureka moment for me. Um, I think regulation of like corporations um, and regulation generally should uh, to follow the same model that most people want for regulation of individuals with uh, when it comes to like crime. And and what I mean by that is. With, when it comes to individuals, we tend to have this default of uh, freedom is good. You start with freedom and you add limits where you have to because you don't want people murdering each other. But the default is freedom. And I was like, wait, why doesn't that model simply work with corporations? Which means um, that makes me more you know, capitalist that the default is freedom, but it makes me more um, you know, uh, left-leaning that you need some really strong regulation because corporations can just be just as selfish as an individual and just the same way we don't want individuals destroying other people's property or whatever we don't want corporations destroying the environment and so mm -hmm. to me that that simplified where i come to and so it makes me very libertarian that my my starting point is that freedom but i think it might take me more into liberalism as far as uh how many uh, uh, protections and regulations, I would add. So mm -hmm. yeah, that, that sums up where um, I'm at. But just to answer, answer your question about my religious belief, I would say ideally, we would want to communicate in terms of things we basically all agree on and not on any sort of special revelation like the Bible. Um, in other words, if I were to vote against abortion, uh, and I would say I, I lean pro-life. I understand the pro-choice position and I sympathize. Um, mm -hmm. um, if I if I were to vote pro-life, um, I would think it's mostly founded on a shared human dignity and not because of Psalm 118 verse 6 or whatever, you know? Um, <laughs> now, I, I yeah. can't. I, I can't fault, like, if you really believe there's a passage in your holy book that says a certain thing, then it does put you in a bind. Because it's like, what do you really believe is true? And um, but there's also an element of, like, there's things that I think that, um, like, I think prayer is a good idea. And people flourish the most when they, they're in prayer. Or even, um, you know, like a weaker form, which would be just like a meditation but I'm not going to make a law about that. And so in that case, I'm having my cake and eat it too. Of I can believe something is true, but I'm not going to force it on others. Uh, it gets complicated. I don't think there mm -hmm. is a perfect answer. I've thought about this, like take an extreme example of, I think it's um, uh, Hindus who um, believe cows are sacred, right? Mm -hmm. Isn't yeah. that right? Um, and do they, so they don't eat beef. Am, am I forgetting this? Is this correct? Nope, you're good. Okay. So far. So it's like, 
if you truly believe cows are like sacred or they are like reincarnated people or something, then, um, then I think it becomes this, um, judgment call balance of you, you can't convince an, an entire other culture to, to also agree to that and, and ban beef. Mm -hmm. Um, but what if it's a, a culture that's 90% Hindu, then, then can you make a law? And I'm actually sympathetic. Maybe you can like, I mean, that's a somewhat mild thing to mm -hmm. outlaw beef, you know? Um, and once again, you can make a sort of, uh, shared sentiment about animal cruelty and that, uh, in general, it's, it's better to be closer to veganism than to be farther away from it. So yeah, that is a really hard thing for myself. Mm -hmm. I feel like the things that I would vote on uh, would align with the UDHR, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And I don't think I have to go into any special revelation in the Bible to 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 affect that. Though, of course, you can't subtract your entire worldview either. Mm -hmm. um, the way I look at the UDHR is influenced by my beliefs as a Christian. But that's true of everyone. And this is where um, religious people are, are not um, unique in this, that the atheists out there, they are influenced by a certain worldview and how they look at the UDHR or whatever. And this is a really interesting point. Arguably, the Enlightenment humanism that is such a foundation um, for something like the UDHR, that itself comes from Christian ideas of human equality. I know that's a huge claim. Uh, one person who's argued for this, for anyone listening who wants to know more, is the um, agnostic historian Tom Holland. Not Spider-Man, it's a different Tom Holland. Um, <laughs> he always gets that, he jokes in every interview, everyone asks him a Spider-Man question, but he's a really interesting historian who is very sympathetic to Christianity, but he's not a Christian. And he just argues that uh, we have forgotten how a lot of things we value about our co common morality, our common human morality, um, arguably come from Paul saying that, uh, you know, uh, there's neither male nor female, uh, Greek or Hebrew or Greek or Jew in, uh, in Christ. Um, so my point in saying that is simply the atheist who's maybe judging the Christian for their worldview being influenced by this thing uh, might, they also might be influenced it in some of the things they treasure the most, which is a fundamental belief in, in equality. Arguably, you could draw a line back to uh, Christianity influencing the Western world to get that. <clears throat> so it's just, it's way more complicated, but it seems like you have to, you have to find common ground. And how can you find common ground if you're debating especially a majority that don't believe in your special revelation of a book, you know? So right. um, that is my very long winded answer uh, to your question. <laughs> I like it. I think, uh, I think I, there's nothing that you said there that I, that I take any disagreement with. Um, it's very similar to, to how I look at it because I think a uh, voting uh, based on your political beliefs too much, like where you're kind of forcing people into it, you know, banning beef if if it's not, you know, a very uh, Hindu-centric culture uh, is laziness as far as the church goes. Uh, you know, a, a, an authoritarian voting bloc within the evangelical movement has created a very complacent and lazy church because mm -hmm. they think that you know if i can vote for a bunch of christians to represent us then we'll be a christian nation even if i don't act like a christian right. ever um and you know so i think if you're doing a good job as a church you don't need to vote as a christian because culture will agree with you because you're changing culture because you're doing a good job as a church and you're saving people's souls and you're, you're, you know, you're out doing things. You don't need to tax people to fund welfare because you have a thriving, uh, you know, community outreach program that is feeding all of the homeless people in your town. Right. You know, we don't need welfare. You know, we don't need exactly. to, 
to legislate morality because everyone's being a good person because we've spread this culture of love and caring and human decency like you were talking about you know i think if we get to a better world where just any almost any religious <laughs> morality or philosophy has in the correct lens is taking a hold uh over the society even just uh, an, an agnostic or gnostic understanding of the interconnectedness of all things and like that just don't be a shitty person you know if we get to uh, if we just yeah. get to be in a place where 90 percent of people actually agree with that statement right. uh, then we wouldn't need nearly as much government as we have and we can kind of get to that libertarian world naturally you know we don't need to uh we we also don't need to fight it as the libertarians do and and tear it down because it'll just kind of go away right uh, yeah. which would be great <laughs> um so and i i wanted to also comment because you were talking about kind of the, the the libertarian to liberal dynamic um and there's there's a term that falls within libertarianism uh which is classical liberalism mm -hmm. which is actually how i would define myself politically okay. uh, and uh, another uh, more popular uh, classical liberal would be Dave Rubin. I don't know if you've ever oh, seen. Oh yeah, him. yeah. Um, I'm familiar with him. So he, that is that is kind of this this idea because because liberalism used to be about freedom, like you were talking about. It's mm -hmm. it's a foundational view of freedom that sees government as kind of a necessary evil to sustain a civil society. So you know we we focus primarily on freedom and push for freedom and then where we could all kind of agree that we might need a little bit of a constraint then right. we okay for the smallest amount of government possible to fix this problem is kind of the yeah the idea of of classical liberalism and so i think based off of what you said that that kind of seems like a a, a better definition <laughs> of yeah how you're yeah, framing no, that, i think I think that matches my ethos and then my question is do i maybe practically take that further than most classical liberals or something would right uh, so wait what's the difference between a modern day libertarian and a classical liberal in your view uh well so i i see libertarian or sorry you said between a modern liberal and a classical liberal no a libertarian libertarian and okay um so i think i think it's it's kind of like the difference between a rectangle and a square uh so you know i think that a classical liberal is a libertarian but not vice versa uh because okay. yeah. a libertarian is just a broader definition so um okay. i base i base my understanding of politics even though i know it's a very rigid uh view of it based on uh the the political compass or if you've seen the with the quadrant so you've got um right. top to yes. bottom authoritarian to anarchy and then right to left uh economically uh so i think anyone that's in the bottom half of that entire square is a libertarian okay um or i should say the top um like minus minus the bottom strip because that's anarchy which is different but mm -hmm. uh but basically that entire thing is libertarian so you know you can be libertarian oh, wow. socialist you can be like an anarcho-capitalist you can be and and within that square contains classical liberalism which is kind of somewhere center top area of that where you know you're okay with a little right stuff. You're okay with a little left stuff. You know, you're you're more yeah. pro uh, pro free trade, but you're still pro like social safety nets. And there's there's kind of a spectrum within classical liberalism as well of you know because I'm sure you and I would still fall differently in this uh, the the map of the political spectrum. I'm sure yeah. I lean more anarchy than you do, but yeah. I think uh, the fact that we're both basing it off of uh the government is is a necessary evil to sustain freedom and liberty mm -hmm. then th as long as long as that's where you're basing it where you go yeah. from there is still libertarian in my opinion uh, that makes sense yeah I, I and i think i would basically agree with that i probably i think i have a much less cynical view of government than the average libertarian uh, <laughs> but it's still i don't want to just add on government for no good reason like i i think there is risk 
every time you do it, risk and promised damage to some degree or another when you do that. And there, so there needs to be a good reason to mm -hmm. add it on. Right. Yeah. I definitely, I've definitely seen enough bad government to where I've, I've, I'm able to take a pretty cynical stand yeah. on, on, its, on its very existence, let alone uh, <laughs> expanding it. But I think, uh, you know, there's there's a movement going on within the libertarian community of uh, liberty, unity, and kind of setting aside our our small differences to, to come together and, you know, actually get some people elected that aren't going to ruin our country some more. Uh, and, and I think, you know, where where a lot of people are having a problem with this liberty unity, um, other than the the fact that within the Libertarian Party, we still maintain this right versus left dynamic, which is complete bullshit. Uh, but then there's also uh, this, you know, do you hate the government enough? Mm. And, and, I, and I don't think that that is the litmus test that we should be using. I think it should be more of a do you fear the government enough <laughs> kind of an idea of, yeah. like, mm -hmm. of like, do you understand why unnecessary government is bad? Right. Because if you if you get that, then we're still we're not going to make the country worse. <laughs> So right. you're you're better you're you're still my ally you know the the enemy of my enemy is my friend and if if we're still fighting to either maintain or shrink the government and not grow it then yeah. we're on the same team because clearly the other team the people who are way at the top of the spectrum that just want to grow the government to some right. massive evil thing those team those people are winning <laughs> like clearly <laughs> and obviously those people are winning by a long shot. So we can't fight amongst ourselves. Right, right. And you bring up um, one, arguably one of the biggest issues in politics today, which is an obsession with orthodoxies. Uh, you know, libertarian orthodox, liberal orthodox, Trumpism orthodox, that <laughs> it's, it literally sounds like religious uh, language mm -hmm. oftentimes, you know, of are you allowed in? Do you have the right beliefs? Um, and I, um, you know, in your, uh, when we were texting about this conversation, you were mentioning, you know, uh, my thoughts on like unity and, and how to get past like where we're at now. And like, one of the main things that comes to mind is fighting that, uh, obsession with orthodoxy and what I would call fundamentalism. That's what it is, is you're adding to your fundamentals, your unquestionable fundamentals. And if you question that fundamental, you can't be a part uh, of this club and, and worse, we won't even have a conversation with you. You're a complete outcast. Uh, we mm -hmm. won't talk to you. And what I would argue, and I want to see if you, your thoughts on this, you, you have to have a fundamental somewhere. And, um, because then, um, you, you end up in this place where you let Hitler, you know, have a seat at the table, uh, or, you know, the worst, uh, uh, people who, who committed the worst crimes against humanity have a seat right. at the table. So we don't want that. So my working idea is to go back to the UDHR that if you, and this is a key part, if your intentions are to uphold a simple declaration of human rights, then you get a seat, seat at the table. Mm -hmm. um, and then we can argue it from there. And we should argue from there. And you should, uh, uh, vehemently argue for libertarianism and the liberals should vehemently argue for bigger government. And then we, we let, you know, people decide which argument won, you know, mm -hmm. but they're, you're both at the table, you know, you're, you're not disbarred, um, uh, or barred from entry, disbarred, whatever the right term is. Um, so, and, and this is a key thing. It has to be about the intention behind it too, because right. if you, you can twist words, so that any viewpoint is somehow a violation of human rights. The libertarian can do that for the liberals. The liberals can do that against the libertarians. And so, but we all know the, the truly good natured, good hearted liberal, the truly good natured, good hearted conservative, um, libertarian, and Hey, even an anarchist, if, if we might think they're very misguided, but we can tell when they actually want human flourishing, Mm -hmm. and they want to discuss ways to do that, yeah. then they should be at the table. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and one example I thought of where you can um, get really confused at this is, and this is a slightly less sensitive topic than something like abortion, but um, like assisted suicide. You can see someone who is pro assisted suicide arguing for it because of human dignity and free choice. You can see someone against it arguing against it because of human dignity. Um, and I think anyone who's objectively looking at it, you're doing their best to reset can can sympathize with both sides and you can still and I, I encourage people on both sides to argue their point vehemently like we need that arguing but we shouldn't say you're not allowed at the table because you're not your pro assisted suicide or against it because you I think a reasonable person can at least sympathize with the intention the intention is still human dignity mm-hmm. and that is our fundamental is the intention of human equality and dignity and then the way we cash that out we need to debate it so that Mm -hmm. that is my way forward and that's the sort of political gospel i want to put out there in this awful first week of january and (laughs) and and just the fact that we're you know something's got to give this isn't over yet you know we are still so divided and we need a way forward and so that would be a starting point um, for me. Oh, and I want to introduce to you a uh, a term I just coined before this, thinking through this, and I, 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 I want to pass it by you to hear what you think. Um, one of the ways we try to maintain our orthodoxy is to slightly redefine words to um, either make see someone sound bad or, um, uh, or not be allowed into, you know, the table discussion or whatever. Um, I mean, just a random example, but I was listening to a podcast where um, uh, it, it was an improv comedy podcast, actually. It was totally off topic, but he was talking about these letters he found of his grandmother, who was a Christian. And she, her son married um, a Jewish woman. And at some point, the, the mother-in-law, so his grandmother, um, tried to witness to the Jewish person, do you know, present the gospel, try to convert her to Christianity, and just offhanded the the host of the podcast um, said that she was because of that was anti-Semitic. And what bothered me about that is you've now watered down the word anti-Semitic and now people who actually are a little bit or a lot anti-Semitic, they now have ammunition against the liberals because now they can say, oh, well, you're just using that term for everything. So um, that's why we have to be precise in our language. Otherwise it starts to lose all meaning. And ironically, we help the actual evil people because right. they can they can look back at us and say, oh, well, you're just throwing words around everywhere. But if we don't throw around words everywhere, if we're careful with them, then we can apply those strong that strong language where it's appropriate. Um, and so I just realized how I was visualizing this, this moving the boundaries of definitions of words. Um, and so I've, I'm gonna call it lexical gerrymandering because <laughs> that's what it is. It's you're gerrymandering definitions of key words to make someone seem evil or outside or or your side good or whatever um and so that that's another part of my political gospel if i can call it that of i want to everyone should try their best not to lexical gerrymander we need to be uh to use sensible obvious definitions of things and then argue your point and convince me please Mm -hmm. so that's another part of my my stance and i mean if you can't tell I have suddenly become more political after January 6th as well. Um, like I, I almost yeah. never posted on Facebook or anything. And and what I will be posting will be more about these broader shared ideas rather than one specific thing. But mm-hmm. I do feel more of a moral compulsion to be in the conversation more because the way the track we're on is not sustainable. Um, and the polarization uh, genuinely frighten, frightens me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it is. It is definitely a huge issue that uh, you know it, it doesn't end well. 
uh, ever, you know, this, this divisiveness and the, the polarization. Um, I wanted to, I wanted to touch on two things that you brought up because you were talking about uh, kind of basing, basing who's allowed at the table on um, the universal direct declaration of human rights. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the kind of, the kind of right wing version of that would be the non-aggression principle, um, which is, okay. which is, I'm not super familiar with that. Right. It's, it's, it's fairly, it's a fairly similar thing just drawn up by kind of two different sides of the, the political spectrum, but to accomplish a similar goal. And, you know, basically the non-aggression principle is, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's self-explanatory, you know, don't be okay. aggressive, you know, okay. um, of, and, and, you know, this gets kind of expanded to a, a very common uh, libertarian saying is, uh, you know, you can do whatever you want as long as you're not hurting someone or stealing their stuff. Right, exactly. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's a, it's a foundation of individual responsibility, uh, as well as individual liberty, because it's any control of someone else that's unnecessary is also kind of seen as aggression through this lens. So it, right. it, it helps kind of filter out an unnecessary government and regulation and stuff like that. And, uh, but there, I think both that and uh, the UDHR are, you know, fairly similar, um, and mm -hmm. just they they're going after two different kind of core values of what I would consider fundamental human rights. Uh, mm -hmm. But you know, use, using these kinds of just universally accepted understandings of of how we should act as humans it, to be the best human to the other people around yeah. us uh yeah i 100% think that you know if you're if you're focusing on that then you have a seat at the table and if you yes. are trying to hurt people or steal their stuff or violate their human rights you know they're then you, know, you don't get a seat at the table um right. and from there the discussion is going to be still super heated super toxic but it's at least you know, we're all still arguing for the same thing. And, and that right. doesn't allow what you're talking about, where we, uh, you know, are throwing around words like anti-Semitic, uh, and just a lot. Now we're allowing other people a seat at the table, uh, because you've watered down this word and they have a substantial argument, but they don't because right. they're still violating human decency and human rights. So they don't get a seat at the table to argue this, <laughs> Hey, you're watering, like, you're even if you slip up and water down words, that's sure. an extra level of protection because those people are still not part of the conversation. Uh, right. But I, I definitely I I think that at this point it's it's kind of difficult to to ignore politics. Uh, you know, it just it influences so much of what we do, uh, and you know, my dad is my dad is kind of a political agnostic. Uh, you know, he's, he's the reason I'm a libertarian, but he's not necessarily an, an active libertarian. You know, I, he raised me to not trust the government, okay. but, uh, but also not to like fight it. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, and I, I think, and you changed that, that part. It sounds like, <laughs> right. <laughs> um, and, and, and it's, I've noticed, you know, the last year or two years, you know, it's very impossible to kind of keep up that, that agnosticism towards politics. Is it, you know, especially with COVID and the mask mandates and the, the sh shutting down of businesses and stuff like that, you know, everyone's life was affected by someone that they voted for in a right. direct way. Now, very direct way. Right. Where that hadn't always been true. You could just vote for people and then not care. Uh, which mm -hmm. we can't do anymore. Um, and I, uh, I wanted to bring up uh, something that, that you, you alluded to a little bit earlier um, that actually Dave had mentioned on his, uh, Ruben had mentioned on his podcast uh, last week with Tulsi Gabbard. Uh, I, I very much see politics as the new religion. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's very much based on the same kind of ideas of, of morality and human decency and then trying to change other people's mindsets to be more like yours. Um, and I think if you, if you really look at it, it's a very difficult to distinguish between the crusades and the war in the middle East. <laughs> you know, it is, yeah, it is, yeah. it is still the, 
the powers that be of the world going into this area and saying, you have to believe what we believe. You have to be democratic. You have to, mm -hmm. we have to, you know, we're not spreading Christianity anymore. We're spreading democracy. Right. But it's, it's a very, very similar approach. And, you know, political movements are just as dogmatic as, as religions. And, you know, I think the reason that we're seeing this is because it's become societally uncool to kill people in the name of religion. You know, people right. still do it, but it's not cool. Right. Uh, so we can't do that anymore. Political leaders can't do that anymore. Uh, but what they can do is kill people in the name of politics. And that's still completely cool. And that's worshipped um, universally around the globe. Uh, so, so they take that example. And we cannot let this bastardization of what's supposed to be the thing that's protecting our, our liberties. Uh, we can't let them do the same thing to politics that they did with religion in in the uh, in the last century. Yeah, that's a good. Uh, point. You know, we we need to make sure that we're we're holding true to our fundamentals um, and this you know the the basis of human rights and of non aggression and you know because bombing other countries does not fit into that anywhere. Right. It also doesn't fit into Christianity anywhere. Neither do the Crusades. Like, you know, there, it's very it's very easy to draw a line there and say this doesn't line up with with the purpose that you were created for. Uh, so stop doing that. Uh, when we yeah. when we attack you like that, it's a lot easier to cut cut these these kind of people like Trump or Biden um, who are just trying to manipulate government for the worse of most of humanity. Uh, you know, we get to shut these people down if we're if we're not try to force our beliefs onto other people then someone like biden doesn't appeal to us if right if we're uh if you you said if we're not trying to force uh that right. people are inspired to vote for someone uh like the current politicians because we are trying to force our beliefs basically right I, it's i mean yeah that's what both yeah. what both sides have campaigned on for a few decades now is you know uh right yeah, vote for a Republican so we can overturn Roe v. Wade or vote for a Democrat so we can pass a national $15 minimum wage. You know, if you've ever lived in the middle in the Midwest, you know, a $15 minimum wage nationally is dumb. Like, yeah, like like New York so this, City needed it. Yeah. Does yeah. does central Ohio? No. Like, <laughs> yeah. So uh, I have to run in just a, a minute, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. But you do bring up.